just like yeah. him. And it's, it doesn't feel like what it's used to. And it's Get out of school and on um, the 25th is our last time. Mm -hmm. uh, Do what? Getting close. Yeah, yeah. All right, I have that it is 10 o'clock, so, or 10 30 rather, and we will go ahead and call the meeting to order. And as always, just a reminder, we have participants participating online, so everybody, if you're out there in virtual land, please. Keep yourselves muted, cameras turned off unless you're speaking. We always have Amy monitoring the, the, the chat feature, which we do have pulled up here on the big screen. So hopefully we'll see those uh, in a timely manner if anybody wants to uh, put something in the chat box. And so with that, Amy, will you please call a roll of uh, the regents and all those who are presenting? Thank you, good morning. Regent Kiblinger. Here. Regent Mendoza. Present. Regent Lane. Present. Regent Benson. Here. Thank you. And then we do have presenters today. We have Carla Wiscombe. Good morning. Daniel Archer. Here. Tara Labar. Here. And that completes our roll call. All right. First item on business is to approve the minutes from our May 2nd meeting. So I will entertain a motion to that effect. So move. Moved by Regent Benson is our second. A second. And then moved and seconded that we approve the minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Next up, things uh, for consideration to go on the discussion agenda for the full board. We have a report on concurrent and dual enrollment from Carla Wiscombe. Yes, thank you. And for those of you that just heard this two hours ago, please chime in on anything that, that I leave out. I'll give a little bit of background. This report used to consist of just the concurrent enrollment, and we looked at the credit hours that were earned from high school students. It has somewhat evolved over time. We um, now, our institutions offer concurrent, they offer dual, they offer CTE. So the report more um, accurately reflects high school enrollments of, of all sorts. But as you can see, Judd McCormick is, uh, I will call him my wingman, but I'm actually the wing woman. He flies that plane and I just kind of uh, ask for lots of things, but Judd and his team have added so much to this report and it's all under key stats. It didn't used to be there and it was something that we had to pull every year. This information has been on our website for months. So it's, it's not new information. I just tried to summarize it. And that's something that I struggle with is how much of that do I actually put into this report? So I have two, two reports, the, the, uh, the sky level view, overall enrollment, and then part two takes concurrent dual and CTE as a, as a system. So um, I wanna first show everyone where key stats is on the website. And the high school part is what I use for this report. There is just lots of information out there that is available for us to, to look at it at any time. So the first thing we're gonna look at is the head count of overall students in, within our system. And the, the first slide, I wanna look back at 10 years. So that first bar is from 2023 22,000 students in Kansas were taking some type of college course. And so it's, it gives you a six year trend. And so that takes you up to 2018. So the next slide is a six year, the most recent six year trends. And we're gonna look at AY 22 with 33,520 students taking some type of, of college or university course. 
and I asked the uh, I asked the group earlier this morning why there might be a dip. Of course, it's the COVID. You know, 2020 we were we were peaking and maxing, and um, Provost Arnsdorf said, you know, at their institution they actually had a situation where a lot of the high school faculty that were HLC qualified were retiring. I know that to be true. I have a lot of friends that retired at COVID. They're like, I'm done. I can't. I can't do this anymore. So, um, but we're we're on another back hill climb, and and I, I think we'll get there. And so the uh, the next slide is the the sectors that are providing this enrollment, and most of the time it has to do with their mission statement. So you can see that the community colleges offer a majority of our courses to the high school students. And then the next slide, we're gonna look at specifically just the university enrollments. They provide, um, our state universities provided courses to um, 1,761 students, Washburn 941 for a total of 8% at, at all of the universities together. And then the community colleges, again, they're offering a majority 22,074 students were taking courses from the community colleges. And then the technical colleges, and if you look at their numbers, they're, they're really growing. They're offering more of the gen eds than they used to. It's not just technical courses, they're offering some of the, the system-wide transfer courses also, because they know that the students that, that are in their, air, their service area are gonna be able to take those too to all of our institutions. So 26% from the, uh, the community colleges. The next, the next slide, I know that um, Regent Lane is interested in this, so I included this. <laughs> it's just the, this is the headcount percentages of all of our students taking courses by, by race and ethnicity. The, the group of white students actually declined from 2017 they were at 74% and they went down to 68% in 2022. There are a few groups that grew a tiny bit over the years, but it's usually just one or 2% that make up the loss from the, that group of the, of the white students. Those numbers are really hard, hard to read. And so then the next slide is the, uh, the headcount numbers, these are the number of students by race and ethnicity that are taking courses. So one, one slide gives you a picture of what, what percentage of the group is above that, at that race or ethnicity, and this just gives you the numbers. And please, please ask questions, stop me anytime. Yep. Madam Chair, I have a quick question. Carla, uh, you mentioned 33,000 total students. Mm -hmm. Do you know what a percentage that is that are currently in dual enrollment. I will have that on in, in part two. Oh, okay. sorry. No, no, no. Thank problem. you. So this is the credit hours earned by all of the students. And as you can see, we have a pretty impressive amount of credit hours that the students in Kansas are earning. I think our institutions do a good job of providing options for our students. I think the one thing that you might need to look at is, is the equity issue. Are all students getting that opportunity? So Madam Chair, Carla, first of all, I need to thank you because you, you tolerate a lot of questions for me trying to understand the data. So in, in looking at the equity gaps, um, do we currently collect data that helps us dig down into the equity gaps specifically related to the percentage of population in Kansas? Um, it's, it's similar, but where there's a gap, there's a gap. We would have to look at the, I didn't look at the population in Kansas. I looked at the, the student population in the public schools okay. and there, there was a gap there. Okay. So within the public schools, and maybe you'll get to it later, the percentage of students taking dual and concurrent, do we have an idea of how many students actually have the opportunity to do that? I, I don't. Okay. Because what we collect is the other end of it. We don't right. we, we don't have much information on the high school. We collect the information of the high school students that are attending our institutions. But I think that's something that we can work with KSDE to look at some of those issues. Thank you very much. 
And the same, I assume, for rural versus urban. Do we, do we know where the majority of the the opportunities are? We there is there is a filter here that you can look at by county. You can tell which counties and the uh, the number of students in each of our 105 counties. Okay, Thank that's you kind much. of hard to hard to tell. Like what what is the? But we 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 know which counties are defined by rural. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Next, next slide, Amy, is the, uh, again, these are the credit hours and the credit hours earned by the different groups very closely aligned to the head count of students taking, taking courses. And then the, the last slide, um, a lot of times we are asked how successful are these students that are taking these courses? So there's a great filter on key stats where you can Pick how many years after graduation that, that the students are either still enrolled or they have completed. So that's the final number out on the end. Amy, one more, one more slide, please. There you go. So the, the student success index on the very right hand column tells you the, the number of students. So they graduated in 2010, three years out, 79.5% uh, of those students were either still enrolled or completed at one of our institutions. And then this goes, we use a national student clearinghouse. So it's like they either enrolled, stayed enrolled or completed elsewhere. So I think, I think those are pretty high percentages for retention and completion. One more follow-up question, Charlotte. Sure. Is completion defined by completing a four-year degree or completion defined by a, a certificate or whatever the natural stopping point is, like an associate's? It's, it's a credential. And if Judd is on here, Judd, you can help me answer that question. They only count it once. So this was my understanding. They only count it once. So if they got a credential, you're counted once. If you get your associate, you, you don't get counted for three times each time you earn a credential. They unduplicate that. Carl, is that the the similar way that that's calculated for the student success rate that KSDE uses? Oh, I don't know about KSDE. We use the student success index for lots of things, but I don't know. Well, it, it sounds identical to the metric. If you go on the KSDE website and you look at the student success rate, it sounds like that same definition. So, so this is the conclusion of, of part one. And um, part two is a little tricky because it's really difficult to get all 32 of our institutions on one page. So this is this is where we I can I think we can answer Regent um, Benson's question about how many are taking dual, how many are taking concurrent, and how many are taking CTE and at which institution. Um, it's it's tricky to divide it up by percentage because some students take CTE, some take concurrent, and then some are taking dual. So there is a lot of overlap, but it's unduplicated by institution. So a student might be going to two or three institutions, but the institution only gets to count them one time. Does that make sense? So on this page, this the uh, Page two just gives some background on how we define concurrent, and it's more about the teacher. The high school teacher is teaching that course. Dual is the student is taking it directly from the campus, either online or they're visiting the campus, or sometimes in rare situations, the, the institution faculty actually visit the high school or, or wherever they're, they're taking it. So, and then Excel and CTE overlap. So that's another tricky way that they're, they're counted in, in both categories. So the first page is numbers and they're tiny. So sorry that those of you in the audience, you might want to go pick up one of those, those reports. Um, and this is online. Amy has put both of these online, but the first page is uh, concurrent headcount. So you can see how many students concurrently attended all 32 of our institutions. And then the next page following the concurrent headcount is the concurrent credit hours. How many credit hours were earned at each of our institutions by the high school students? Mm -hmm. And then is the next one is dual. And at the top, you'll just have to look at the headlines, dual enrollment or headcount 
for all courses, dual enrolled students. And then dual enrolled credit hours. And I know there are lots and lots of numbers, but if you go out on key stats, it's absolutely, I can get stuck out there for hours playing with the different filters. There's a lot of different filters that you could use. And then the last one, last two pages are CTE headcount and CTE credit hours. But I, I think it's interesting to just look at the numbers and acknowledge the work that our institutions are doing for high school students. <clears throat> That really didn't start out to be their mission, but it is something that I think they do a very good job at. And again, I'd like to thank Judd and his team. This, this report has grown over the years. It just keeps getting bigger, bigger and bigger. Madam Chair, yes. Carla, what stands out to you the most that might signal to us some actions to improve opportunity from looking at the data? I think the equity ones, most of all, um, I, I think the institutions do a good job of that. I don't think our institutions know the high school students as well. Our high school counselors are swamped. They're dealing with mental health. They're dealing with so many things, but that's our connection. And Tara has done a great job of connecting our high school counselors to lots, lots of our resources and to our institutions. So I think that's something that we're, we're definitely on, on, on the uphill climb for collaboration. And we have a, a dual credit steering committee that looks at these things. And I've learned a lot just from the monthly meetings, just hearing from folks out in the field. But I, I think the, uh, the access, it's not just equity. Um, there are high schools that are in pretty, I wouldn't say uh, urban areas, but populated areas that they do not have opportunities because it depends on so many different facets. Are the high school faculty qualified? Um, do they have a history of that? The, the district that I live in, you have to take 12 hours of concurrent to get the scholarship to enroll. Not everyone can handle 12 hours. So it, it's just all over the place. And I think that um, one thing that we could do as a system is, is try to standardize the expectations. You know, every high school should offer two system-wide transfer courses and two CTE pathways. Because I, I don't think that's happening but that's not information we currently collect. So strengthening our partnership with KSDE in, in this area uh, sounds like a, an important issue. And then when, when you, and we'll talk more about this when we get to our committee report, but when you talk about standardizing and offering at least two, uh, we're not suggesting the methodology of how that's offered, that's a, a local partnership. Right. It, it just that the students would have access to that, that everybody at least offer that. It shouldn't, your, your geographic location shouldn't dictate all of your opportunity for access. And it's not just the rural areas, it's, it's everywhere. Do we get a sense or do we have data or perhaps KSD can tell us how many of the um, dual or concurrent hours are, are also awarded high school credit so that the student is taking one course for two purposes? Well, the legislatures took care of that for us and said that if you're offering high, you know, courses that it has to count for dual credit. Before, we didn't really care. We didn't know. We kept track of the college courses. Um, that required our high schools and our institutions to, to develop new partnerships. But the legislation passed said that if you're taking a class for uh, concurrent, it needs to have dual credit. And I think most of them were, but that really opened up the, the eyes of many high schools that we need to do this more consistently as well. Although um, some of that is elective up. credit, is that right? That's what I was going to say, That, but there aren't any requirements that say that it has to be elective versus a, a I'll call it a core credit or a, a course that's needed for graduation. So you could still have someone taking 
Comp 101 and they're not accepting it as an English credit required for graduation. It could simply be an elective. Is that right. correct? But KSDE passed a resolution that Blake was pretty forceful in getting across that said, these are our recommendations yeah. that Comp 1 should count for Comp 1. And, you know, Kansas, as, as you ladies know, is a local control state. And so it's difficult to tell every high school that you're going to offer, you know, the exact credits for the courses that they take, but they did present a resolution that that was the, the expectation. It was guidelines. Thank you. So one last wondering, I assume that this data does not include a, uh, AP or IB course data. No, these are these are courses, but we do have Tara, Tara is getting ready to, to give the AP and AP is considered credit for prior learning. Sometimes they give actual credit, but our institutions give it based on another a policy that if they have a score of three or above, they will get uh, college credit for the equivalent course at that campus. Thank you very much. Great work. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. All right, moving on uh, to our next item of business. Um, Daniel with uh, performance funding and math reform. Thank you. So um, just to kind of recap, we presented this uh, to this body last month. And, um, we're now positioned to, to move this forward to the board for consideration today. So obviously I'm happy to entertain any questions, but um, seeking to put this on the uh, agenda today. And Daniel, uh, just one quick question. All of our institutions had opportunity to provide questions, feedback, and it's my understanding we really only heard from one that That's correct. had some concerns. Correct. So, may I ask a question? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, Daniel, my questions aren't to suggest we change anything because I'm very supportive of this moving forward, but as you and I have had dialogue, I, uh, I have a little consternation at the timeline. Uh, not for implementing this, I think it's the right thing, but yeah. how how long is the right amount of time to get these practices in place so then we can move to, are they working? So would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. And so <clears throat> essentially this is kind of a three-year process. There's kind of a planning piece and then there's more of a soft launch where we mm -hmm. kind of dip our toe in and then fall of 2026, so we're talking 39, 40 months from now is when we're full scale implementation. Um, and so Obviously, fall of 2026, spring of 2027, and so forth. I definitely think that we're going to be looking at data, comparing before and after. I think also we've got some really explicit guidelines to provide flexibility, but also to uh, be able to differentiate between the different models because there's different ways in which you can deliver co requisite. And so I think that also would provide some insight as to which models are working if we're talking about lesser prepared students, what's the most effective model, maybe the students that are right below, um, is a tutoring option suitable? So I think that we'll be able to analyze and assess um, and possibly make additional policy changes as we go. Um, but I definitely think that we'll be able to, to, to see effectiveness pretty shortly thereafter. I mean, this is, that's one of the benefits to this is that I know it's a three year timeline, seems like a steep hill, but the reality is this is something that moves the needle pretty quickly and does generate uh, better outcomes within usually the first year or two of implementation. So certainly we're gonna be hyper-focused on collecting data and, and analyzing it. And um, but yeah, that's the, the plan is to, to roll this out over a three year period. So I'm hearing you say that we won't just roll it out and then wait for the data after that. You're gonna be examining how it's going as we go. Yeah, I mean, I'm hopeful that, it, uh, and obviously I've, I don't want to commit our data team to anything uh, right now ahead of time, but I, I would be hopeful that we would be able to analyze it really by semester. Um, I know that there's processes in place to kind of close out the data and things like that, but I'm hopeful that we would be able to at least look at some preliminary figures um, each semester to kind of see where things are at and, and obviously update everybody on this because there's going to be a lot of eyeballs on this. Um, 
as we as we move forward because we want to be able to to see is this working is it working for certain populations because you know we have these equity gaps in graduation and there's a lot of things that go into that but i think a lot of it some of it definitely is attributed to uh, the fact that certain populations have been disproportionately placed in remediation and then changing this i think is a big step so obviously we want to be able to you know evaluate that continuously and not just have a report every two or three years but really stay focused on it daniel uh, i guess this would be a, a question and a comment um question first as we have we know we have different institutions that are at different places implementing things we're always going to have some that are kind of right you know, the trendsetters any thoughts of how we can create a space not only for us to get the data that's being generated but for all of our institutions to kind of come together and, and share what what they're seeing i mean it seems to me like if somebody's finding success or having a challenge creating that space to help support them would be something that we could do um, Absolutely. as a system. And I think this is a process and I think that we'll have kind of a group of people from institutions in some kind of advisory capacity that would be looking at data points and looking at who's been um, especially successful. And, you know, and, and just another piece in this is that uh, professional development is certainly going to be a big component. And um, the good thing is, you know, we're not the guinea pig. There's been a lot of good work that's been done. We're definitely committed to bringing in some of the best faculty that have worked on co-requisite and worked on pathways and bringing them here and having them talk about what worked for them, what didn't work, what they learned, what's worked with more at-risk populations and so forth. And so I think we'll, we'll definitely be providing a lot of that up front, but I think there'll be, you know, some sort of community that we have, professional community that we have that will evolve and will advise us on things and we'll continually look at those things. So I definitely do not see this as something where we just approve something and everyone does their own thing, but we are you know, learning from each other and we're engaged and all dialed in. Thank you. And just one more comment. I really did like the way that this um, laid out the accepted models. I think it's clear. I know that it's based on models that have been successful. Um, not just you know some arbitrary you know this is this is what we mean but i think it's i think it's sets some good guardrails and yet it gives flexibility um, for our institution so i really do like the way that that was put together so thank you to everyone who worked on that and, and gave feedback and input um, i think that's well done and i'm sure any opportunity for institutions who might want to weigh in this morning about what kinds of things that they've been thinking about to move this forward absolutely um any, anything that anyone at the institutions would like to to share questions comments concerns We have an, it will be helpful to have placement guidelines that's popped up there in the chat. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's definitely something we have kind of in our preliminary work timeline in fall and next spring and, and really looking at some high school data, some ACT, SAT score data, and really trying to connect those dots. But there's been some really, really good research on that that's been done in places like Arkansas and other states that are somewhat similar um, where they've looked at 10 year data sets and, and really shown that that high school GPA and, and certain grades in high school courses are a better predictor. So, would you expand on that a little bit, Dr. Archer? Because um, I really want to applaud moving to multiple measures. Yeah, right. Uh, but it truly is multiple measures. Yeah. And if I understand it right, a set of assessments, if the student does not qualify, they look at GPA. If the student does not qualify, then there's an opportunity for a local assessment. That way, right. we're yeah, ensuring kind of that it, we have three points at least of it to examine qualification. Right. I mean, I, the way I would envision this is there'd be, you know, you have your ACT, SAT piece there, uh, which I think all our juniors are taking the ACT now. You know, SAT is still something we have to consider, though, because the reality is Colorado is an SAT state. Illinois is a, a big provider. Um, Texas is SAT. So there's certainly a lot of those 
larger states that are kind of in the surrounding area that uh, have that. But yeah, definitely having a high school um, performance standard. And the good news is a lot of our institutions are already doing that. Um, I think it's just a matter of trying to have something that's standard that we can communicate to K-12 and say, this is a college readiness standard. So I think that's the biggest challenge uh, because we there are really like 32 different answers for what you know qualifies for college algebra. And I think that creates a lot of mixed messages. And one of the things that you know, we learned and work with the Dana Center, you know, we're kind of in this rookie cohort. So four other states that are just starting this work. And one of the first questions they asked was, you know, like, OK, you know, raise your hand if your state doesn't have a you know, standard for course placement. And we were the only one of the four that didn't have one. Uh, so that's very much a common piece. I realize it's a deviation for what we've done and probably, you know, kind of a, a difficult adjustment, but it's very much a common practice. And I think it's a really necessary element to what we're trying to work more collaboratively with K-12 to have some really clear readiness standards, um, I think really simplifies that, that process and gives the students really a target to kind of shoot for. And Dr. Archer, kind of in that vein where you talked about some research that we can look to that had some pretty good data sets, um, as we expand our, our pathways beyond college algebra to include um, a couple of other courses, do we, is does that same uh, data set to guide placement? Does yeah, that does and, that and exist, or does that get a little more limited as we begin to branch out into the math pathways? There does, and I, I think that generally what you see with that, and of course, you know, we're going to get people together and get their input. But generally, what has been uh, how it sort of played out is that there are less restrictive standards for like contemporary math versus a college algebra. There's not a high as level of requisite knowledge needed for a contemporary math or even stats compared to a college algebra. Okay, just one last question. We have some students who um, aspire to go into the military and take the ASVAB. Uh, would that also be a measure that could be looked at in this model? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say on a local level, absolutely. Um, I don't know if doing that at a statewide level um, that may be something we want to do down the road maybe not in the immediate time frame but yeah I, absolutely that could be used as i mean we would encourage institutions to have you know diverse portfolios and look at a lot of a lot of different things i mean there's grit scale there's all kinds of things that could be utilized at a local level that, that have proven to be effective thank you very much all right thank you any other questions or comments uh, two things while I'm thinking of it. Amy, did I need to have a motion made to put the, the concurrent and dual enrollment report on the full board agenda? We did. Thank you very much. I, so I messed up and didn't do that. So we, we need a, a motion on Carla's report uh, to move that forward um, to the board. I'll make a motion to move the dual and concurrent report for board consideration. Thank you. A second. And a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Sorry about dropping the ball on that one. Um, so now looking at our performance funding and math reform, we need a motion also to move that forward to the full board for its consideration today. So moved. Second. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded that we move performance funding and math reform. Board, board, board. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. I, a, yes. Yeah, no, I don't see the professional development opportunity for the maps. Um, I think that might be helpful okay. for institutions yeah. just we'll to make that. sure we're on yeah. the same page about yeah. what right. is being asked. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, we can we so do that. add that yeah. to that's the, right. yeah. that. I think that'd be helpful. Yeah. No problem. And um, on that note, um, typically College America is. Uh, an entity, a nonprofit organization that has, I think, 41 of 50 states are participating. We are not as of now, uh, but they really have driven a lot of the conversation and a lot of the development of these degree maps. And we're hoping to join next fall. Um, we were going to try to get them in before the end of the year, but there was just too many conflicts. And so we kind of tentatively plan to have them come in um, in September. And so um, that, you know, is something that's Funded by philanthropic foundations, there's no fee for us as a state to participate. It gives us access to all these resources and people. And so I definitely think there would be opportunities to provide professional development through uh, people like America. They, they've led a lot of work. So. Thank you. 
and Provost, thank you for that um, suggestion. And just a uh, point of personal privilege, I, I just want to say that I'm so excited about the math pathways. I mean, four years ago when I came on board, this was one of those things that I said, gosh, I see all of the states around us doing this, and I think this would be so good for um, the talent development pipeline. And so I'm so excited that we're making some progress, real progress toward that. It's just exciting. I think that it's going to benefit many, many people um, out there in our state and ultimately um, will help bring more students into our institutions. So thank you to everyone who has uh, been working on this. And I know there's still a lot of work to be done, but um, I think we're going in the right direction. All right, uh, next up, Tara Labar has a report on Kansas Free Application Week. Good morning, thank you. Um, this is a idea that we've been kicking around for a while. And um, so uh, Dr. Archer and I decided just to bring it to you for discussion and, and kind of share the concept with you and see what your thoughts were and, and maybe um, if, if there were next steps, what, what they might be. So uh, about five years ago, Colorado started an apply free day and, and they were able to get all of their institutions on board. And it was one day in October where every higher education institution waived their application fee. Um, they, they did that in conjunction. They utilized cable marketing spots in both English and Spanish, and they they allowed um, residents of Colorado to apply to these higher education, all the public higher education universities, um, community colleges, uh, universities, and some of the private institutions also signed on as well. Um, and for that one day, none of the institutions had an application fee, one day. And, and no caveat, no no fee waiver, nothing. Just if you were thinking about it and you wanted to apply for higher education, you could apply. And and um, so in 2020, their third year, they saw one day total of 56,896 applications in the one day. So in 21, they opened it up to a three-day window and they've been doing it ever since. And again, as a way to kind of open up higher education to their residents. Um, and so I heard about this program probably in the spring of 21. And it's, it's intriguing and kind of in thinking about what would that look like in Kansas and would that be something beneficial for us as well and so in talking with Daniel um in talking with um others around the state looking at our apply Kansas campaign and 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 how the those programs would work together we I put together this paperwork and looking at what if we did a, an apply free week and did something similar here in Kansas um, as a way to open up higher education to anyone living in Kansas um, for, it would be open to anyone seeking um, a bac baccalaureate degree, an associate's degree, a certificate. So we would, we would hope that our technical colleges would be on board with us, our community colleges and our, our public universities. We would also invite our private institutions to join us if, if, um, it would be great if everyone in the state would would jump on and we could say all higher ed institutions are free for this one one window this one week um, in October it would co coincide with apply Kansas so obviously would you know be able to advertise that with with um, that program and and essentially it just removes the cost barrier not only for high school seniors but also if we think about the folks that we lost, in the pandemic so folks that maybe graduated in 2020 folks that graduated in 21 or maybe started and then had to stop out um have maybe been thinking about it um and just didn't weren't sure if they wanted to take that step gives them the opportunity to put in an application and see what happens next um 
And so, again, thinking about a marketing campaign, maybe even um, reaching out to the governor's office and seeing if we could do something kind of on, on a statewide level. Is that something that could benefit uh, our, our Kansas residents, our enrollment in higher education, and also just, again, benefit the credential earning potential of, of our residents here in Kansas? Um, I think that the Colorado data shows us that the biggest benefit they've seen in this program, not only just in the applications, but they've seen an increase in first year, um, in first generation um, students, in applications submitted by students of color, um, transfer students. And so it, I think there's there's definitely benefits to our high school seniors, but I think there's also benefits that can be found in our adult population as well. So I, I uh, shared this information with the um, students, the student body um, advisory committee back in March, and they were able to look at this proposal and then they sent me feedback and we also discussed it in their meeting in March as well. And um, they, the, I think the conversation overall was fairly positive. I think they, they all kind of shared the, the incentive that anytime we can break down barriers to higher ed, it can be pretty powerful. Um, and then they also talked about, you know, what about lost revenue? The revenue from application fees is is real. Is there is there something that we can do about that and um, mitigating that? I think there are, we do have some institutions across the system that as in conjunction with Apply Kansas have been waiving their application fees for the entire month of October. So my hope would be actually that might give them some of this revenue back by making the window smaller and putting a lot more um, emphasis and energy behind that window. Um, also, they, they maybe suggested taking it from a week to three days. So, you know, kind of, again, taking all of that feedback into, um, into play was, was helpful. Um, but they definitely had said it was worth consideration. And so, um, the, I guess I'll, I'll, before I open it up to kind of your thoughts and questions, the last thing I would say is the week that I, I'm proposing or looking at right now would be October 16th through 20th, which is in the middle of October. Um, most of our, our, actually all of our institutions have priority scholarship deadlines beginning um, at the earliest November 1st, November 15th, December 1st. So this wouldn't push right up to their deadline, which is good because, you know, that's always a, a rush on, on applications. And the other thing is we saw the bulk of our Apply Kansas events happen in that week, that middle week, which is when the PSAT um, test has traditionally been scheduled. And so they, you see that one testing day where a lot of the grades test and we see a lot of Apply Kansas events. So I think it would, it would coordinate well with a week that already is full of Apply Kansas application events across the state. So, so with that, I just open it up to questions and comments and, 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 and your feedback. Just out of curiosity, what, what is the average application fee? Is it a hundred dollars? Is it a thousand? It is, it varies across the state. I think our lowest is $20 and most of them are 40. There's a couple universities that are 30. So, Thirty to forty dollars. Question: Do do we know how many of our institutions have some sort of an, a free application day or week or or month currently? Because I know it seems like I see more and more. I'm aware that that somebody is is so. Is doing or, that. Well, with regard to Apply Kansas. Um, we, uh, it, everybody does a little bit differently um, for the month of October. So one of our institutions does not have an application fee. One of our universities does not have an application fee. So, and I forgot to mention that as well. Um, and then another one of our universities waives um, their fee for the month of October. Another university provides a coupon code for Apply Kansas students for the month of October. Another um, three of our universities 
aren't able to waive their application fees for Apply Kansas, that's okay. And then another institution um, will waive their fee, but the Apply Kansas students have to submit a fee waiver. So um, saying that they're an Apply Kansas student. So right now it's kind, it, it's all a little bit different uh, across the system with our universities. Community colleges typically don't have an application fee, and then some of our technical colleges do have application fees. So then that that plays into those communities. With the um, you mentioned making the window smaller, so would you be suggesting that those who are doing the month or who don't even have a fee that they would have to now charge a fee, or would they still have the leeway that well? Oh no! Yeah, we would. So we wouldn't have but, to. But they we would have, have to charge a fee. They would open all month. They would. Or, yes, absolutely. Wanted to be. Be sure I I didn't hear what I thought I heard you say because I'm like <laughs> I don't really think that that's what you meant, but I may have. No, no. Right. Just would. For those of them that have been waiving their fees for the month, I look at it as it would give them that ability to. Maybe just yeah. if we all went on the window and did the same thing, could we get more bang for our buck that way? So what's the path forward as obviously some of our larger institutions, I would guess that these application fees are a pretty good chunk of, of revenue. I mean, what's the what's the, the path forward in getting everyone on, on, on board to do this or looking at at data, you know, how many students do they have to bring in that wouldn't have applied and gone there otherwise in order to recapture that? And, uh, you know, certainly there is a financial aspect here. I know it's going to be good for students, but we also have to acknowledge that with our larger mm -hmm. institutions who are, I, I'm only guessing who the ones might be that say that they can't do this, but sure. thinking, you know, $30, $40 times, you know, your entire incoming crop of new students would that would be some real money um i would like to request that we have that analysis so we know what we're talking about i, I would i would really like to see that mm -hmm. because frankly i don't know why we're charging fees we need students we want to encourage them to have this vision i think it's a good conversation for the board to have perhaps during our retreat to say what do we need to do to eliminate fees for yeah how, how do we get there i think I it's i think it's important to get there because i think it's good for students and that's what we need to be focused on but um yeah how do we how do we do it without taking away a source of revenue that may be paying for somebody in the admissions or recruiting office at at some of these institutions and i don't know what the answer it looks is, like from the chat to washburn has also remove their fee, um, which is new. And I don't know how long ago some of, of you know these institutions like Washburn did away with the fees. If somebody did it in recent history, it would be really interesting to see, okay, when you did that, how did that impact number of applications you were getting? How did that impact, you know, did your overall enrollment then go up? Because obviously you get the right number of students, it offsets the lost uh, fee revenue. So yeah, just to be able to to have that analysis for everybody to look at, that seems like that might be a good next step. I just have a quick question. It's related to that region. It's yes. um, <coughs> what impact it has had on the number of applications. As we know, in the last couple of years, students are applying to upwards, they're submitting seven to 10 applications. And so um, by putting a nominal fee on there, sometimes it separates the students who are really have a genuine interest from those who are just, uh, I'm not saying we're not, we waive the, the application fee for low income students, but I just kind of want to know what the overall impact it would have on workload and sheer number of applications that students submit. Appreciate that point, Provost. Um, so and I I'm think hearing too, you say a minimal fee keeps people from just blasting out applications, even though they have no intention of going like the young man who, what, 150 applications he sent out that was in the news. And he had no intention of going to most of those institutions. Also, a point of clarification, and thank you for bringing that up. Um, the, the fee waiver for low income students for all of our universities that have a um, application fee is available all year long all the time. So this, this program wouldn't impact that 
at all, that process at all, it's always available. Um, it just would be in addition, but we also know that's sometimes a hurdle as well. And so while that's always available, this would, this, this program, I think just opens that door for a, a very short time or, or a set amount of time. So Do you can we, yep. just to let you know, Jean Rodiker has her hand raised whenever she's. Oh, yes, Jean. Hi, good morning. <laughs> or at least she's at the COTS meeting. Um, but I wanted to um, have two comments and then make a suggestion. My first suggestion may, may be for your consideration to refer this matter either back to SCOCO or COCO for discussion. Um, and they could provide you with the analysis that you're requesting by institution. Um, I know for the University of Kansas, we receive about 15,000 undergraduate applications a year. Um, and then from a technical perspective, our vendor allows us to open the um, application window once a year for changes. So that process is happening right now. So if any changes are implemented for, for us and maybe for other institutions, the time frame for, for um, the time frame would be different than, than what you're discussing right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great suggestion. I'm sorry. Are you pointing at me? Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, I think that's a great suggestion to have some more conversation in, in SCOCO or COCO. One thing I would also point out is that I think Fort Hayes certainly, and I bet my, my peers in the room, my colleagues in the room from the other institutions would say, when we're bringing big groups of students on campus for other events, like Hispanic College, Hispanic College Institute, our, our big recruitment days, those days, we're not, we're waiving application fees as well. Mm -hmm. So in addition to things like Apply Kansas and some of that great work, uh, there are other days on our respective campuses where we're offering a, a free application day because they're there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a huge ROI if you can get them on campus. <laughs> um, um, they're, they're more apt to apply and then to um, Register for yeah, absolutely. I, I think that would be uh, great to refer that back to, to have those conversations. And certainly, we don't want to do anything that takes away from those uh, activities that you are finding successful. So that sounds like a good next step. I don't think we need a motion or anything to that. Just um, so, Tara, good work, great thinking. So I, I think just yeah, continue to. Kick the idea around and, and learn from it and uh, learn from each other. Thank you. All right, moving on. Our next item, uh, back to Dr. Archer. Proposed criteria for program review process. We have some graph. Yeah, so um, just a couple things on this. So um, we built a proposed review schedule with some parameters in mind here. Um, and uh, provosts are, are reviewing that. And um, they're going to provide feedback on that by May 19th. I actually got feedback from Provost Tabor. So thanks, Provost Tabor, um, just about an hour or so ago. So um, we've already got some of that feedback, but um, May 19th here in a couple of days. And then we also created um, kind of a common reporting metric sheet here, and the provosts are going to provide feedback on that by May 26th. Um, need a little bit more time on that one. But I just want to kind of reemphasize, I know President Flanders is pretty emphatic that this be done. I think the board is also um, really supportive of, of wrapping this work up by June. So we're still kind of looking at, at getting this all done uh, by that, that last board meeting in June. Um, so, Dr. Archer, as we, as we think about that, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same road going forward with what we intend this process to do. So it's, it's my perception that we have asked the provost to bring us a process, which they did, that looks at both uh, processes for uh, addressing low enrollment, but also uh, addressing new programs so that we have a process that does both things. I think that's, at least unless I have just really missed the point, I think that's what this group was was looking for. So just want to open some opportunity for you to respond to that. I 
or the, any of the provosts want to weigh in on that is that am I on the same path that you were on in terms of your thinking about what we were doing here? Yes. So a process that helps us do both things, right? And align to your HLC timelines. Right. Okay. All right. So a, a new and, and, and allows us to um, perhaps um, stop the hamster wheel on constantly reviewing programs that we are mission critical for our institutions, but that are always going to be under enrolled. Um, and I think we can we can we can share examples right now. But I think the plan was that we were going to come forward with what those would be um, as part of this. Um, I'm, gonna speak for, I'm finding myself starting to be a little confused about what, what our goals and objectives are. And so I think it'd be helpful for me uh, if we could all be on the same page going forward um, about what those goals and objectives are for the process. So then we can, I can, I don't want to speak for my fellow provost, but I can speak into that process <coughs> and give feedback according to those goals and objectives. Um, I think we have some other questions about some of that documentation, but. Um, and it, and at, at this point, um, I mean, forgive me if I've overlooked something, but is that still something that we need to get our arms around better as far as identifying, as you put it, get off the hamster wheel? Because I know that was something that I really wanted to make sure we weren't doing again and again and again, bringing those same mission critical programs forward, that there is some way that, that you propose, here's what we think they are. We all say, yes, we agree. And and we're all clear; those are not the programs that will come through the process in this manner. Now, I mean, I I would expect that internally you will continue to look at those. That if if you've had a program that for whatever reason, even though it's mission critical, and we don't we're not concerned that it's not going to have a real high enrollment, or that it's going to be very expensive to operate that you're monitoring it so that if for some reason it's quality begins to go downhill, students aren't being attracted to it, that you're looking at it going, hmm, we, we still need to dive into that. So I'm not quite sure what that should look like. But anyway, I'm not, I'm not seeing yet that we, we have that process figured out what identifying those programs and saying we're all on the same page that uh, Chair Kibler, the I agree. I think part of where we're at on the gray area is making sure that we are able to define how you get on the list mm -hmm. and then and then how you get off the list possibly. And I think mission critical is also another term that may have a little bit of gray in it because uh, an example might be that uh, someone in the community or there might be a, a, a real need for a particular training to go forward because of the safety issues or something and maybe and so it might not come to this uh the enrollment stage we think it ought to but we need to offer it for the for the good of the community and good of the region good of the state so if, how do you get on the list i think is really the critical question and also so that it's not overwhelming that you're not there are some programs that obviously year after year after year they're there exactly. and i don't know that that you need to spend time that as much time on those on a regular basis so that's fair that's the hamster wheel yeah, yeah and i think that was very much our intent that we're coming up with a process that gets us off of the hamster wheel so we're really looking at those other programs because yeah i'll use teaching as an example if someone comes and says gosh we just don't have very many teachers enrolling in the program let's no we're always going to have those teacher ed programs at our at our institutions so while yes, we need to be looking at them internally and saying, mm, what can we do to bolster these up and make them more attractive? But yeah, how do we get off the hamster wheel and really look at those other things that they aren't mission critical? They, you know, for whatever reason, the, the enrollment's just not there. How do we stay in tune with industry and, and what their demand is? So I think that's, that's where we want to be spending our time. So, so just just so I make sure, because sometimes I'm so concrete that I miss the point. This program review process will be for new programs, looking at low enrollment programs, and then we'll have a separate process for mission critical yet to be defined. The provosts are working on it. Am I am I with you? Is that 
Right. Oh, and I, all I by May 29th, so we can get it to the board in June. Good. <laughs> I like all. I like that. fast. Uh, <laughs> the, I, I like the term that Shirley brought up the other day, and, and, and re, then the low enrollment. That's the review and monitor programs. It's a broader that allows Thank us you. to encompass some of these other areas. But. And so, in in the sorry, I'm sorry. Um, in in some of the documentation that was shared last week, um, what Provost Smith is referring to is it was, it was listed as underperforming programs, and I guess I think we need some definition of what that means. Um, what does underperforming mean? Um, and uh, Provost Lefevre's uh, suggestion was maybe using different terminology than underperforming and review and monitor from the RPK. Uh, language. Um, so that, that was just to give some yeah, context. That's, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's exactly. What we're talking about. Keep saying that so that gets in our head. So we're with you. And, right, and we you. reviewed, I think it's important to remember that uh, two years ago we reviewed all the low enrollment programs and are kind of a high scrutiny process. So I don't know how beneficial it is just to kind of look over the same programs over and over and over and kind of have the same justification. So I get that's part of the puzzle, but I didn't necessarily envision it being hyper focused on low enrollment programs because we've kind of done that just recently. So, well, and what we found from that is we got a lot of the mission critical or a lot of the programs that I'll use philosophy as an example that there aren't a lot of majors in philosophy for good reason. There aren't a lot of jobs available, but it supports a lot of other things and it has a lot of. I guess it has an enrollment, a lot of enrollment, but it doesn't have a lot of majors. Um, yeah, so we, you know, we found a lot of those things, but that's not really where we want to be spending our time. That is helpful. And I mean, I'm not sure when we started down this road, we always said we're, and, and then this can evolve into how does new program approval look different, but I'm not sure that we really have addressed new program approval yet in any of the conversations that we've been having. Am I am I off base on that? Or has that been coming up alongside as we go? And, and I don't want to assume, have the regent seen the document that you shared with us last week? Uh, some of them have, yeah. Okay. So, so I think in, in that document, which was the response to what we presented to you all last month, um, it continued to have that section of um, academic program review policies and procedures that talk about at a minimum, we should analyze and assess at, in section B, market demand, student demand, centrality of the program, quality of the program as assessed uh, by current, by its curriculum and impact on students and the service the program provides the state, the cost effectiveness. In, in my experience, that is this, that is exactly what we tell you about a program we're bringing forth. And, and, I, and I think there's great parallel there. And if we say here, here is the common metrics we're looking at, then I think it dovetails right into it. But I didn't know how explicitly. So, so it may be that we just that. add some language that this is language that, that by which we would propose a program, review a program. And then I think as you as you move forward on that, um, we're reporting on that uh, as we go forward. I I would just say again, and I, I think I would echo what what um, Jill said, and I think I, I hear from our other provost as well. Um, what what changed in that really, or what got refined in that was um, uh, going back to an underperforming program. Um, section and and I think we give everything that you need from us. I think we look at um, underperforming as a is a very loaded term and it's a very broad term. And so it's going to be helpful for us to know that we're on the same page that you were all on if you define what underperforming means from your view and how and how that moves forward for us. Um, and then I think the only other thing that you've asked for uh, that I think that we probably need some, some agreement and clarification on is that section where we talk about how we go about reviewing our programs internally, because I, I would say that I feel like, um, and, I, and I believe Provost Tabor shared this as well, 
I can't speak for all my other colleague provosts. There is a sense, I think, in what we hear that there's not um, there's not perhaps a, a belief that our internal processes that we use regularly are rigorous. So I think I can maybe speak for us to say we really want to be able to show you and tell you what our processes are internally that we go through so that you understand what we're looking at, what, what we do, so that you can perhaps believe that we do deal with programs that are not um, not well performing on a regular basis. And, and that's an HLC requirement we have. And, and the HLC requires that we take action on those programs. So I see Chuck's hand raised. So I'm maybe speaking for you as well. Uh, Provost Tabor, please. Thank you. Yes. And, and uh, Provost Bicklemeyer is right. That's, that's my view as well. And I think actually, to me, the, the most exciting step forward that we're taking in this is that we're going to have an opportunity to showcase the program review processes that we do on our campuses, because I think they are actually rigorous in a variety of ways. And they're rigorous in ways that go beyond just talking about what programs need to be eliminated, but rigorous in ways that identify programs for opportunity and programs that need different sites towards sorts of development. So I'm excited about the chance to talk about that. Um, and I think that the regents will be, will be, um, will be happy to see the work that the, that the universities already do uh, in these areas. Um, and the other comment I wanted to make um, is that nobody's mentioned the percentage of programs that should be um, looked at you know, more deeply. I don't remember what the exact phrase was. I, I also like um, the phrase that, um, I think it was uh, uh, Provost Lefevre that had suggested it, um, but other, other, the, 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 the programs that are gonna be getting a deeper look, um, I think that percentage is gonna vary and I think it should vary. We should expect it's not going to be a constant 5% or whatever percent it is over time. If we do our work, then that, and we do it well, then that percentage should go down over time. And so to me, we need to be figuring out how we determine what is the appropriate number of programs that need that deeper dive each year, rather than setting an arbitrary percentage that we look at in each year. So more criteria based as opposed yeah, to... That's exactly right. And I think that's where the question is, how do you define underperforming? Yeah. More of a standard than a percentage. Thank you. Appreciate that, uh, that feedback. I think that's helpful for me, helpful to the other regents that... I, I think it's very helpful um, making sure that we're moving together forward. I, I just also want to say that if there's a form that's out there that helps with this next step, I think BASC members need to have that so we can be working on this with you rather than after you've already made some things. So I don't know, Dr. Archer, if it, I mean, you know it's in draft form, but I would encourage that the BASC members, you mentioned that some board, uh, board members may have it. I don't know that BASC has seen yeah, it. Yeah, and I apologize. That, that certainly wasn't anything um, that I was trying to hide from anyone or anything right, like that. I think it was just a matter of giving the provost time to give feedback. And um, we initially were going to give a little bit of time for feedback and they wanted more. So we worked with them. So I'd be happy to send that to everybody. No, no problem. Yeah, it'd be nice for all of us to yeah. have that. Sure, sure. Just a quick question for clarification on the mission critical. It, is there a system wide definition of mission critical or to Provost Smith's point? Are the institutions allowed to determine what is mission critical for your part of the state? For your employers? A great question. Uh, because if, uh, can I, uh, it depends on your interpretation of that because you might look at Pitt State and what do you think your mission is at Pitt State? And then, and then again, at one time there were missions for each of our institutions and, and those were different. I mean, it could be aviation at Wichita State, it could be, you know, uh, certainly. Uh, different kinds of sciences and engineering at different programs. So I, I think that's, again, probably something as we get into this, we may want to revisit and, and again, uh, make sure we all have the uh, same definition for those kinds of things. I think it's a great question because uh, I think over time that uh, 
that's been out there for quite a while. I don't know when the last time was we even revisited that. And, and I just would want to add to that. And again, I think I hope I have a faculty representative from KU here on the line listening to this so they can hear me and, and that I am doing my part. I think if there's one thing throughout the last year, or however long we've been having this conversation, I have tried to, to do my part to represent the interest of the University of Kansas and our faculty. Um, one of the things that RPK I think did very well in the public presentations they made was to highlight um, what the Carnegie classifications of universities are and to distinguish between what a research intensive institution <coughs> have a mission, um, which uh, at, in Kansas, KU and K-State have the classification of a high research institution, um, which is I, I think what Wichita State's designation is. And then um, I think it's called the master's level, but it may be something more for Fort Hay State and, and Pitt State and Fort State um, because there are national expectations about what mission is. And, and the reason I differentiate that so importantly, again, because, I, and I can't speak for the loads of faculty for any other institution, but that means for KU as a, as a Carnegie intensive and AAU institution, the expectation is our faculty have a 40, 40, 20 load. That means they research 40% of their time, they teach 40% of their time, and they serve their discipline and nationally 20% of their time. That means what our mission is and how we use our faculty is very different than how the other institutions use faculty. And that means that the first question we ask is what is our research expertise and what is our research mission? And that determines what our teaching mission is. And it determines the way that we, we use a department and the faculty in terms of how many, what undergraduate programs, what graduate programs and what doctoral programs we have. And all of those frame how we think about a tight performance of a program, which I think I, the story that I would tell about mission critical and underperforming for KU would be, I think, incredibly different than how the other institutions would talk about what mission critical is. So, so I hope that we don't go to, and, and some of the, process, the, the improvements I think we've made is not to assume that each institution fully has a separate mission that's only based on subject matter or that we all do the same thing somewhere in there, there has to be something about a recognition of a research intensive institution versus a high research public um, metro institution that has a very important mission and the missions of, of Fort Hay State, Pitt State, and Nepore State that are incredibly important to the state, to the region and to the masters and, and graduate level work they do as well as to the workforce development. So, so there's something between we're all completely unique um, and that we're all the same that I think is really important to capture in that conversation around mission critical and, and underperforming that, that I hope this could allow us to acknowledge. And I do appreciate that I think that in the document that, that Daniel shared with us, in a conversation with them, and like there was a recognition of research intensive and review there and a, and a high research and then the comprehensive teaching nature of, of campuses. All right. Provost, thank you for continuing to uh, keep that at, at the forefront of, of our minds so that the four, the four of us continue to hear that and remember that we, we need to. Thank you. And I want to go back and be surfaced and survive my faculty. Go. So <laughs> I, I agree. I think Provost, Smith. Our, uh, Provost Picklemeyer did an excellent job summarizing that. One one other addition to this, I think it's important to recognize too that I think all the institutions too, while we have missions and we have certainly uh, directions that we we're trying to make the, move the institutions in advance, we also are advancing board goals. And sometimes those board goals uh, or you, somebody might say that's not as directly related to you, to be quite honest, if you look at some of the definitions, some of the economic development that we do might not be viewed sometimes in that way. So I think it's important as we advance some of the programs too, that you see how we've tied that to the statewide initiatives as well. Thank you. Thank you. So Madam, Madam Chair, as we're here in this great conversation, I'm, I'm looking forward to our, our next steps, but it reminds me that we had talked about a workload policy uh, from, from the board that would simply say each campus needs to have a mm -hmm. workload policy. Might we have an opportunity 
in June to review a draft of, of that. So we can think about, and it could be tied closely to Carnegie, but um, to address that that particular issue. Well, I think we left it that the institutions, the way I, and I apologize if I misunderstood, but the way I understood it, that the institutions were going to create their own workload policy. Yeah, and did we have... Did we have a timeline on that? I'm trying to remember now if we just talked about it or did the board actually yeah, take action? Yeah, I think we talked about trying to get to a policy in place effect. to specify that. And then, you know, we, we kind of threw out June knowing that that was probably going to be pretty difficult. And I know is K-State is one that reached out to me and said that, you know, they've, they've got something they're looking at it, they're moving forward. But obviously the, the challenge you run into is that the um, faculty sentence don't typically meet in the summertime. And um, obviously, this is they be integral in this uh, process, and so um, some institutions are going to need some time in the fall to work on this. For yeah, sure. I'm, I'm not. Uh, I think we're on the same page, okay. Dr. Archer. I'm not suggesting that that they have their policy in okay. place. I'm suggesting that the board should have a policy that says each campus shall have a policy okay. by yeah, next yeah, yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I'm asking okay. for. Yeah, and I, I thought we were. We had had conversation about that, but I, ha I don't believe we've seen a draft. We have not, but we can, we can have something in, um, in, in June for sure. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you can understand from this conversation that we're all very committed to, to making this process better for all of us. Um, what I would like to have clarity on leaving this meeting is what's the expectation from the board by June? Um, we, we want to do this right, and um, we want to do it well, and um, just want to better understand what the expectations are for your June meeting in, in a month. What what do you what you need complete? And I think what uh, I can only sp speak for me, and then the others can join in. What I would want to see is so we can see what the path forward is that we know. Okay, by this timeline, this is this is what the process will look like for bringing forward those mission critical um, programs that you would each put on there. So we need a, a process for identifying those. It sounds like we still have some more definitions that we need to get nailed down, but that we would could be to June to the point that we say, okay, here's here's what whatever the term is that we're going to use for underperforming and what it means. Here's whether it's a criteria or a percentage that we we'll use going forward that we know the timeline that everybody's on. So we would know, all right, your HLC cycle looks like this, looks like this, looks like this. So we know when each of the universities would be doing these reviews and reporting out. So, so to me, by June, it's more process and timeline that we Need, would need to have agreement upon, and then then we'll go forward according to whatever that that okay. timeline is. At least that's what I'm envisioning. And I'll open it up for comments from the other regents. I, I frankly, I'm looking for here's our process for review, and we can certainly say we're going to. We're going to review this in six months to make sure that we didn't miss anything. But here's our program review process, which includes new programs and revise and monitor. <coughs> now, the mission critical, um, I'm open to hearing that you need a little more time to define what goes in that bucket. But it seems like it all goes together to me. Yeah, to I'm me, that's, maybe part, maybe of, that's part of the process. And then it will be that timeline for, and by this date, you know, we'll... Have, and we'd be ready to talk to the full programs. board about this next month, right? Doable, not doable. Oh, okay. What's missing? Can I respectfully ask that we may get a little more guidance from you all through email or whichever way about what you mean by mission critical? Or, or you know, maybe it's, it's Daniel and, and, and President Flanders. And, and what you mean by underperforming, we could say underperforming, I think, again, the RPK, like, what was that? Just review the program to monitor. Monitor. monitor and define that. But I'm, but again, that's where I think we feel the tension of, we think we've put a rigorous process in place and there's some sense that it doesn't, it's not rigorous enough for you all. So, so I think that's where, 
if, if there's any any parameters you can put for us around what you mean by low performing okay. or what underperforming or what you mean by mission critical, we'll be happy to fill in the details. But I think that's, and again, I don't know if I'm speaking on behalf of everybody here, but the tension exists between we think we've done it and somehow we are trying to read lines here, but it, it, we really would like to not have a percentage. We'd really like to show you what we do. And there's something that we're not giving in what we provided that that you're looking for, and we just don't really understand what that is. Am I being so, Madam Chair, may I suggest that we schedule an in-depth conversation on this topic so we can together mm -hmm. get to a, a place where we sure. we know what our outcome is and when we want it, etc. Yeah, let's let's do that. I know I have um, some conversations scheduled later today. Um, keep our staff on on that so we can follow up and have more conversation thank you we appreciate it yeah all right so that will be our our path forward on that but again uh, good work by everybody I, mean, I continue to think what you have brought us is is good and and we'll try to get that clarity that that we all desire All right, uh, Regent Lane, concurrent and dual task force draft recommendation. Thank you so, so much, Madam Chair. And Amy, if you could pull up that um, document for me. I wanted to give you an update on the Diploma Plus Dual and Concurrent Task Force that was established by the board. And, and as, as I do, I just have to thank Carla again because she's been a vital part in trying to guide that ship that's gone kind of all over the place. But we are planning to bring a report to the full board next month. Um, it will have an, an accompanying page to this document that will give some research, some data, and some rationale. Uh, we, we weren't able to get that done for today. But wanted you to see where we are, let me highlight for you in the um, upper left-hand corner is the vision that the task force has articulated, which frankly is a, a, a credential, a certificate, or a degree for every graduate. That, um, and this work is vital to have our partnerships with KSDE working hand in hand with us. I think the community and technical colleges and the universities are, are ready to go to achieve that vision. We just need to help our partners move that forward. Uh, below that, you'll see the charge of the task force. Uh, we were asked to accelerate the talent pipeline to ensure affordability, I, I think, and access, and uh, to dramatically strengthen collaboration. And I think that the group is doing that. So let me just draw your attention to the opportunity box. Um, we have had input from our students. We've had input from the dual and concurrent. Uh, the community college presidents helped us articulate the challenges. We also reviewed national research on the challenges. And so the opportunities are designed to try to begin to address, frankly, the equity gap that we have in Kansas and ensuring that students have access to general ed, um, college courses, as well as Excel and CTE. And the very first one is that we establish a statewide policy to offer dual and concurrent in all the high schools. Carla mentioned earlier, uh, <coughs> at least two gen eds uh, tied to our gen ed system-wide transfer courses, at least those, and at least two CTE courses, which uh, is ahead of us in, in that way. So uh, I think this may be, uh, in addition to the funding, and there are funding items listed in number um, six, seven, and eight, um, the policy issue may be a heavy lift because we really want to get buy-in from our state board of ed partners that we've got to have a policy that says that every high school needs to offer these opportunities. Now, we're not uh, suggesting how they're offered. They could be they could be dual, they could be concurrent, they could be online. I think that's up to the partner in the region to figure that out. But if we want to move the needle, for all students, uh, we need to have a policy in place. And that's uh, also a recommendation from the Education Commission of the States as they've done research on this, that in all the attempts to, to provide these opportunities, if without a policy, equity cannot be achieved. So I, I wanted to make sure you saw that one and um, hopefully you can uh, offer support there. 
and then uh, align our program offerings that are happening through dual and concurrent to our system-wide transfer courses and to create an education award pathway. So what, what we're doing, we have Superintendent Adrian Howey's working with Carla really leading this, articulating down to the freshman level at high school, the course paths for some of our key economic driving sectors like education and healthcare. And so creating examples so that the high schools can see how this might work. Uh, certainly looking at flexible models to meet the higher learning commission requirements. That's a big barrier. Uh, we need to figure out different ways that folks can approach that. We have some great examples in the state of how that's being done. And then um, ensure the statewide eligibility and admissions criteria. So this ties directly, Dr. Archer, into the work that you're already leading in, in terms of standardizing how one becomes eligible for the courses. Um, and then dedicated funding. Without dedicated funding for this, uh, we fear that even with a policy, we'll, we'll struggle to move it forward. So I wanted to give you a, a snapshot of where the recommendations will land. Um, Dr. Carter File, who's the president at Hutch, and Adrian Howey will be given the presentation to the full board in June. But if there are things that you see in this that we need to think about adjusting, please let me know. The overarching goal, while the vision is every graduate has a credential, we're shooting for 75% of the graduates to graduate Diploma Plus with nine to 24 credit hours, with a certificate, with something besides the high school diploma. So any feedback that you have for me today would be great. If not, I look forward to talking with you about it between now and the June meeting. Thank you, Regent Lane. Uh, Daniel, a quick update on the system-wide gen ed package and upcoming deadlines associated so, yeah. with that. Thanks. So yeah, so we have a, a seven, seven member uh, GE council that's been formed. So they're gonna be working on some implementation activities over the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of things coming up here, we have what's called, uh, if you look at your uh, little outline or schedule that I sent out back in February, it's called the GE master course list. And that's where institutions list all the courses that fall in each respective bucket. Like these are the courses that fall in social and behavioral sciences. These are the ones that fall in arts and humanities and so forth. Um, so that is due by June 1st, which is two weeks from tomorrow. And I've probably received, I don't know, maybe five or six of those um, at this point here. So I just want to make sure that's on everyone's radar. All right. Question. Daniel, if you have concern, what's the feedback process then on that after you receive the list? Yeah, so I think we'll kind of do an internal review and then we'll, uh, we have it at the GE Council, that's one of their duties is to just kind of verify um, what's been submitted. So I think we'll just review it. I mean, if there was something way outside the box, then we would probably contact you. But if we envision this will be a pretty smooth process. So. Thank you. Uh, Lane, Educator Workforce Task Force update. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll be brief. You have a document in front of you that. Uh, outlines the, the great work that our uh, deans of our colleges of education have been leading. The structured literacy plan and training is underway. They're developing modules that will, can be used for uh, across our system with teachers who are pre-service uh, and also uh, opportunities and modules for our current teachers so they can be fully uh, up to speed, competent in the delivery of structured literacy in its totality. I'm really thankful that Regent Mendoza is working on a subcommittee to help us uh, address the needs of uh, English limited language learners. I don't know if Regent Mendoza, you want to uh, provide any update on that work? Um, I, I don't have an update today. We were scheduled to have a meeting and individuals weren't able to attend, so um, okay. that's being rescheduled. Appreciate you being involved in that to make sure that we're addressing the, the needs of, of learners that are have special needs approaches that include special ed and, and our dyslexic uh, population as well. Uh, K-State has um, st stood up as the fiscal agent that's helping us uh, pay the stipends and additional resources for our faculty who are, are leading this work. So 
we're very pleased with how quickly they've been able to move this forward and we'll have it uh, fully implemented this summer and into the fall. The second um, committee that's been working on the Universal Elementary Education <coughs> Licensure Degree, this is also very exciting work where we will have a universal program for developing elementary educators. Uh, they met earlier, uh, I think it was last week, to get feedback from the community colleges. Do you know how that went? Barbara? Yes, it went very well. They, they had a couple of revisions and um, some tweaking based on the feedback, and I think it's an even better document. That's great. So by fall, we will have a universal elementary ed program in place across our institutions. So that should help us very much with uh, recruiting and supporting our uh, future teachers. So thank you, everybody, for the work that's been done on, on that. So the next step for uh, that educator workforce task force report is for the board to start talking about how we might fund some of the other recommendations that were in that report. And if you recall, there were 19 and we have tackled two of them. So that's my report. All right, Regent Lane, thank you for your work on both of these committees and, and I, well. I have an additional um, yes. comment for that. We have met with um, KSDE on several occasions and I think we may be ready to present um, some information as far as the apprenticeship program goes. I don't know if we need to schedule that for our virtual meeting or wait until um, next one. Um, do you think you'll be ready by May the 30th? I, I think you can give it um, an update. Yeah, we've made a lot of um, a okay. lot of progress. So, well, let's um, plan then uh, as we transition to suggested agenda items for our May 30th virtual. Um, let's put Regent Mendoza on there for an update. Uh, and then Regent Lane, do you think that you will have any additional updates to give us at the virtual meeting as well? I, I will um, commit to having the, the full draft report ready so Bass can approve uh, on the uh, Diploma Plus dual and concurrent, and then we can move it forward. And of course, we'll have new program approval uh, on there as an item to continue discussing, hopefully finalizing at that point, and any other topics of discussion. All right, hearing none, I think we're ready for a motion to adjourn. I have a motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Motion by Regent Mendoza, second by Regent Lean. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you all. 12.01. We almost got that. Anytime. Okay. <laughs>